Hello everyone, nice to see everybody today. Welcome to the Union Pacific STEAM Update, our first official update of 2018. Well, I want to start out by introducing some very important people in, in my life and uh, in our crew. Uh, my wife, Nancy, she puts up with my train life. We call it our train life. Saturdays and Sundays, Monday through Friday, we pretty much spend our life working on locomotives and train things. And that comes from a childhood interest in trains that I got from my father, Ed Sr. Many years ago when, when we were young, Dad would take us along the track and of all things, we would watch the 844, 8444 back then go by. For a young person, five, six years old, it was terrifying, but something happened, it did something to me. And I never thought that I would have an opportunity to work on big steam locomotives. Uh, not to mention the 844. So thanks, Dad, for all you did and all the stuff. We'd go on travel trips like a lot of families. Anytime there was a train, my dad would make a certain sound, and that would alert me in the back seat. And I would be like a puppy dog looking out the window, trying to find where's the train. Telephone poles, fence lines, anything that resembled a railroad track had my immediate attention. Struggled in school a little bit because school didn't pertain to railroading that much. But uh, I'm really thankful for a great family and great friends. And here with me today we have Ted Schulte. Ted. Ted's been with the program, been with me. I've known him since I was 17. He and I met years ago. And uh, Ted and I had an opportunity to work I was working part-time at the Georgetown Loop in the 1990s, and he came up and rode up and down the track a couple of times with me on one of the oil burners, the 12 and the 14, a couple of big oil burning shays up there. And uh, after watching, watching us do it for a time or two, I said, why don't you have a crack at it? Well, if you know Ted, Ted is one of the best, I would say the best machine operators I've ever known. He has a natural ability and a natural skill for machinery. Understands it. It just, it's just a gift that he has. So he did it, and within minutes, you wouldn't know that he hadn't done it all his life. Well, back uh, when I began my, my current role as manager of the STEAM program, regrettably, we went through a pretty tough transition where we lost some pretty key people. Lynn Nystrom passed away just a month before I took over as manager. We had another individual that was nearing retirement. He was a conductor, was not an engineer, so he, and he didn't want to be an engineer. I found myself needing people. So I, uh, I remember that time in 1990, I invited Ted up. We were just getting the Lynn Nystrom funeral special, the 3985. We decorated it with Lynn's favorite colors. If anyone knew Lynn Nystrom, he liked chartreuse, kind of a purple color. So we put that on the locomotive and took it out for a test run. We made one trip up what we call P1 right by the depot. And I told Ted, okay, your turn. And he didn't want to. This is the 3985, a big superpower, 4664, 280 pound pressure, 535 tons. He just climbed on it a few days before. I'll back up the story real quick. When he got there, the day that I called him and asked him to come up and, and work with me, he showed up later in the day and I handed him a booklet. As a matter of fact, this is the book that I handed him. The Alesco Instruction Manual for the Exhaust Steam Injector. And I said, you're going to need to know how to work that thing. Take it home and read it. So he gets over there and he didn't want to do it. He wanted to watch. Well, everybody wants to watch. And I want you to fire this locomotive. And, he, and you remember what you told me? <laughs> he didn't want to. So I said, sit down and do it. You'll be fine. And no exaggeration. By the time we went by the depot, the stack was clear and the safety valve was lifting. And I went, yeah. And so we worked together for, for the several several months, he and I on the locomotive, and I was showing him all the little tips and all the little tricks. 
as a locomotive engineer, you want a good fireman, and you need to have a good locomotive fireman, somebody that can really do a good job for you, because you've got your hands full running the locomotive. These big superpower engines, and if you're into steam locomotives, you want to see them run correctly, you want to see them handled properly, you want to see them fired correctly, not a bunch of smoke and a bunch of amateur stuff going on that eventually can damage the locomotive and make your life really hard. So we've worked together for a long time. I'd also like to introduce Jimmy Thompson, who's one of the newer members of our team. Jimmy's an outstanding welder. People often ask, how do you get people to work for the steam crew? How do you hire people? We give a lot of tours all the time. And it's only natural when you're looking around a big locomotive shop that you would expect to see the older generation working on machines and making parts. And here you got guys, Jimmy's 26, Zola's my daughter, and Garland is, is, is younger as well. Uh, our foreman, Austin, who couldn't make it today, he's helping his father move. Uh, he's 30. And he's the foreman of the crew. The foreman runs the crew. So he's responsible for laying out the work. And not only can he do that good, but he can really, he can make great parts. He's a great welder and a great machinist in his own right. So that's how we get, we get people that are passionate and really care about steam locomotives and want to do a really good job and make good parts. We brought some extra parts with us today, some new and old and I'll talk a little bit about those, but when we're done with the presentation, we'll have a little bit of time for question and answers. You can ask any question you like. We're not, it's not secret. It's not a nuclear missile program that we're in charge of, so there's nothing secretive about it. A lot of air brake parts, some old rusty stuff, tooling, and all a bunch of different variety of stable, stable tools. And then this is something you don't see every day. This is called a DD7 made by the Nathan Manufacturing Company, and it's a hydraulic oil pump. And the big boy has four of these. The 844 has two, and this was rebuilt by Ted, one of Ted's many duties in the shop. He, gets, he has the responsibility for working on intricate work. So without any further ado, let us start our presentation today. And once again, this is dedicated to the person in my life, my wife, that puts up with all this. And she gets to ride behind me in the cab and she goes with me whenever we do all the traveling. It takes a lot to put a trip together. A lot of people don't understand. You just don't run a steam locomotive out of the garage and head out on the main line. There's literally weeks and weeks worth of physical planning. You have to go look at things and coordinate with people. So it's, a, it's just a, a huge job. And here's our crew. Now this is the crew just before we departed to go on our trip to Boise. And over here on the left, I'm just if it's okay with everybody, I'll just point everybody out. On the far left is Troy Clagg. He's a machinist out of, or excuse me, electrician out of North Platte, Nebraska. He's fitting in really well with this crew. This is kind of like, I guess you could say almost like the special forces in that you've got to do whatever you've got to do on a crew. If you're stuck into the routine that all I am is X, Y, Z job, then we're gonna to have to have a lot of people on the crew in order to get all the work done. And realistically, we're very fortunate that we're fully funded with a set nine, including me. So we're very, very thankful to have everyone. And his characteristic smile, right next to him is Jimmy Thompson, who I introduced a moment ago. And Jimmy, like a lot of us on the crew, is is living a dream, working, excuse me, working on the uh, special equipment, <clears throat> working on this big special locomotives, traveling around, watching all the people's reaction, and welding the boilers, and doing the heavy duty, hardcore work that we do to keep these engines running. And just to Jimmy's left is his partner, Don Greer. Don's been with us since 2012. He joined the crew two days before we slid the drivers in Texas. That was Donnie's first experience with the crew. And he's an outstanding metal fabricator, and he's the second part of our two-man certified welding team. Behind him is Donnie's close friend, Kurt Clark. Kurt is our steam locomotive fireman. 
and you know me here. And here's Austin Barker, Foreman General 1. I've known Austin since 2010. Uh, he was another very good find. Uh, just one of those, literally a one in one million type of candidate that you would have come across your hiring session. And then Bruce Kirk, the tremendous tool and die maker. Bruce has a gun shop in Fort Collins. So Bruce specializes in making whatever type of tooling you can imagine. And these creations are from his mind. And he will come up and he's just relentless in his pursuit of making just the right tool. And this stuff takes a long time. It takes a long time to, to work on something. So this isn't a shop that you would be accustomed to like in a modern machine shop where there's heavy production, there's alarm bells ringing when it's lunchtime, you know, all this really heavy pressure of production. Well, as you know, we want to have this locomotive done, so we do have the pressure on us, but we don't want to get to the point to where this place becomes a sweatshop. It's hard enough as it is. This is the crew when we got back 30 days later. Notice the smiles. Some of them aren't as big as they were, but they're still there. And that's the magnificent 844 that you see behind us. My, uh, my Weimar writer helped me put this PowerPoint together and he wanted this, this slide in there. That's our beloved shadow. If anyone knows what a Weimariner is, you can understand. They're, they're, they've got quite the personality. He goes with us when we make our, our reconnaissance trips. And one quick shot of the 844. Imagine, if you will, change the number on the cab and make the cab a little bigger and the boiler a little bit longer. And that's what the 4014 is going to look like when we're finished with it. It served its life as a big utilitarian coal burning. 7,000 horsepower power plant. Its new life is just like the 844, a public relations ambassador for the railroad. We won't doll it up quite as much as we have this locomotive. This was a passenger locomotive. And the 844, having never been retired, has a very special place in our hearts, but in the hearts of thousands of people, I would say tens of thousands of people employed on the Union Pacific Railroad. So this is one very special locomotive. So if we put a little stainless steel nut here and there, and we keep the jacket nice and clean, and we nickel plate the throttle, and do nice things like that, it's, that reflects the corporate pride we have in our program. And here's one more quick shot of the 844. Look at how massive that locomotive is. For those of you that aren't really familiar with the big boy locomotive, I'm going to refer to the drawing back here. And this is the 844 right here, if you cut it off about right here. And you take this four-wheel engine truck and you put it here. Well, look at what we have. You've got a 4884. The boiler pressure is still 300 PSI. The valve dimensions are nearly identical. A key difference is the cylinder dimensions are a little bit less or a little bit more than an inch smaller in diameter and the drivers are 68 inches versus 80. So look at the massive machine that the Union Pacific needed to do a job. Imagine what that will look like. I have the good fortune of operating, running and firing the Challenger a lot and that's a big locomotive. The Challenger it's kind of like a sports car in a way, that it responds quickly, being articulated, it's nice and flexible. You can see why they like to use them on passenger trains. That small wheel accelerates quick, just a really fascinating engine. And of course, the sound of an articulated is something I won't, I won't simulate it for you. I often like to make sound effects. But the sound of a steam locomotive is something that it gets in your mind. And maybe that was the thing that really got me into steam locomotives was the whistle and the sound they made. Being of a different generation that had never seen steam locomotives operating, I couldn't relate to them like the generation that saw them. But there's something about the steam locomotive that's just fascinating. This is a picture I took yesterday morning 
We've got some lights set up in the firebox. I'm not going to go into too much detail on the boiler work because we kind of like to keep some of that stuff fresh because we've got some really neat boiler work that we're doing. But for those of you that are familiar with the nomenclature of a steam engine, you'll know what that reflection or that shadow is, which means we've got the rear tube sheet in already. And we're making revolutions to do some big rivet work that I'll talk about, and then get the front tube sheet in, and then the tubes are going in, and then the superheaters, and it just step by step, just like we did on the 844. Here's a drawing that I bring with me a lot. This is how we make our new tools and our, our new materials. Is we take the Flannery drawings that I have up here, and we redraw them in CAD, and we send them to these various suppliers that are set up to make bolts and to big, make forgings for us. So we don't have to do the forging at the shop. We can send it to a shop that can give us the right certified materials and processes, and we get the bolts back, and all we have to do is cut threads on them. I'm sorry you can't see the detail on that too much, but this is a what's called the boiler detail drawing for the official Union Pacific drawings. And this is the Flannery staple system, if you will. And these are all the different types of staples that you'll see on the big three superpower classes, the 844, the 800s, the Challengers, and the 4000s. The 800 utilizes a lot of this style of arrangement where you have a sleeve that's welded on the outer sheet and then a cap that covers that, that seals that up. On a big boy, because they were so big, they, they couldn't afford that extra little dimension there from a clearance standpoint. And that was one of the reasons that the, the uh, 4000 have the MKS style. And I've got some of those up here to show you when we're done talking. This is Bruce working on some stable taps getting those all sharpened up. We're uh, right around 500 staples that we're going to replace in the, in the 4,000, which isn't much when you know how many staples the thing has. But we've got to do some sheet repair work, and in order to do that, those staples come out. Locomotive being a coal burner, every three hours or so, when that locomotive was in maximum power production, you had to put 28 tons of coal on that. So in a three, hour, three to four hour period, you were blowing 28 tons of coal through the stoker onto the grates. Some of it didn't stay on the grates long. And then it went up over the brick arch and through the tube sheet and out the stack. And coal, when it burns down, burns down, as you know, for those of you that have ridden behind a coal burning steam locomotive, a pretty good size, almost like a bacon bin. And it's really abrasive, like a little glowing piece of pumice. And as that thing is flowing through the firebox at tremendous velocity, it's wearing down the metal that it comes into contact with. So the UP and a lot of railroads welded what they called eyebrows on the leading edge of all the staples so that abrasive effect of the cinder flow wouldn't erode the staple head away and you were constantly having to replace the staples, not because they were breaking, because of cinder erosion. On an oil burning locomotive, we won't have that. Here's another set of tools uh, that Bruce has made that I brought with me here. And they are to prepare the cap surface on this type of stable arrangement in a, cutting, a cutter so you get the correct relationship between the cap and the sleeve so it seals. You've got, in some cases, thousands of those caps. And when you go to hydro the locomotive, you could have a real mess on your hands. If you didn't get that part of the process right, you're going to have a lot of leakage. So, for example, when we did the hydro, that's what this drum head here is for. On the 844, we had very little leakage. We're talking a little drip here, a little drip there. Because when you hydro a locomotive, the regulation says no leaks. What does that mean? Are we going to look the other way if we've got a stream of water here? If there's water drizzling out of the cylinder cocks, if there's water shooting out of the turret, you can't have any leaks. So I take that really serious, we do. So when we put the boiler together, it's tight. The other reason you want that is when we travel with the steam locomotive, we take it out on trips with us, and there are times when we're gonna be out 
close to 40 days. Well, by federal regulation, we are only given 31 service days before we have to wash the boiler. We may not have to wash the boiler in that 40 day period. So what we want to do is we don't want to steam the engine up or have a fire in it for a 24 hour period and we gain a service day on the calendar. And that's how we're able to stay in the field for a long time. If your locomotive leaks here, leaks there, you're not going to be able to do that. It's going to be out of water and out of pressure and you won't be able to go that 24 hour period. So all of this plays into a big strategy. This is another tool that's come in really handy on the 4000. This is called an MKS cap cutter. And Bruce made this, it's pretty heavy. It's got six cobalt uh, tool inserts in here. And it's designed to cut off the MKS, pardon me for getting in your way here. And it cuts the weld off of that cap that I showed you a moment ago that's welded on top of that staple. So it's not as destructive as using a torch. Sometimes we use a plasma, or excuse me, an air arc. That's a really quick way of getting them off. But you gotta be really careful with that arc that you don't gouge into the boiler when you're cutting that cap off. And here's literally dozens and dozens of the big long radial staples. I've got one up here. The radial stays are up on top if you're familiar with the layout of a steam locomotive, the cross section. Looking at the firebox in here, your crown sheet is right here. You can see when you come up, you'll be able to see it. This is the crown sheet. Well, it stayed along the side in stay bolts that are a little bit shorter, and they get longer and longer as they get up toward the top. When they get up around the top, those stay bolts begin to arch over in a radial pattern all the way up to the roof sheet, and they go down and they connect at very close intervals called a pitch to that crown sheet. Well, the radial stays being very long and they're flexible with the ball on one end, there's a lot of movement in a big locomotive firebox. So we're replacing a lot of those radial stays. When the Union Pacific changed out the tube sheets on these engines, they took out the first row customarily. And because they were doing that almost on an annual basis, they made the first row of stay bolts the sleeve type, so you didn't have to cut those caps off. Well, we're going to go back and we're going to make it back to the MKS type. And here's a little bit uh, smaller, flexible type KJ stable. Is this too technical and too boring? No. no? My, my bosses, when we talk about stuff like this, they, they, their eyes glaze over when I start talking KJ and Flannery and Elesco. <coughs> well, these are made on one of the lathes that we've rebuilt in our steam shop. Uh, a couple years ago we took, it was the worst example of all the machine tools in the shop. It was just filthy, crudded up, didn't run, and it looked terrible. Well, we wanted to use it to make, uh, to roll the threads on our stay bolts, and when you come up afterwards, I'll show you those stay bolts here. It does a really beautiful job cutting the threads on the stay bolt. Garland, our machinist, he's one of my two machinists. He takes great pride in his workmanship and he goes to the trouble of putting thread protector sleeves on each bolt. <laughs> I just, I love that. A lot of pride. Now this is some of Jimmy's handiwork. This is a close-up of that MKS cap welded on a staple just adjacent to it. Some of the caps sat up on the top of the locomotive. When the locomotive sat in California, the reason I wanted the 4014 over all the other big boys is for this reason. It had less corrosion and it was less worn out. Some of the machinery on other locomotives were a little bit better, but on balance, the boiler was in the best condition. When you're talking about a big 300 pound pressure vessel, look at the size of this thing. You want to have 100% of that boiler in the best condition you can make it. You're going to have a little corrosion here and there around the safety valves. Pine needles for five decades were raining down on parts of the boiler. 
down here along the cab where this brace is here. We've got to cut that out because it's, it's wasted very, very thin. But on balance, the engine's in really good shape. This is one of the areas that's a little bit more corroded. But when you clean it up and you take and you analyze the thickness, make sure it's, it meets the minimum standard and then some, you're left with a cap that's only 3 sixteenths of an inch thick and it's pretty well pitted. So part of Jimmy's responsibility for the last, what's it been, two weeks now? He goes around and he cuts off all those caps. I had a conversation with, with him yesterday. I said, this locomotive is going to be yours longer than it will be mine. Because I'll be retiring here in a decade or maybe 12, 15 years. And after that, I pass the responsibilities of all of this to the next generation, of which is him in Austin. So I put that responsibility on them. If you want it to be on there, that's your judgment. But I know he's going to use the good judgment. And if, if he's not happy with it, I won't be happy with it. So he's over there busily cutting them off. How many caps have you got off already? Well, we've got about, about 300 off, and I've got about 150 welded back on right now. He's got 300 off, he's got 150 back on, and there's probably going to be a dozen or so more that he'll peel off that, that we didn't catch on the first pass. We're not done taking all the little stuff off yet. I mean, there's little things, it doesn't quite look right, we'll get it off of there. And here's another picture of what they look like when they're a little bit more corroded. Don't let that uh, deceive you. Some of that pitting looks worse than it is. And here's what it looks like when they're welded back on. Part of uh, what we've been doing over the last seven years is fixing up the shop, cleaning up the shop, fixing up tools, and getting the equipment that we need. Part of that involves cleaning up the area above uh, an office type ceiling. Not unlike this ceiling here, it was a little bit different. In 1990, it probably sounded like a good idea at the time, they installed uh, that acoustic tile ceiling in the shop. And it probably served pretty well. It retained some of the heat in the winter months. It's a big building. It's hard to heat. Change the lighting around a little bit. But what happened over time with all the numerous broken windows, if you've seen the steam shop, it's just a huge building. Lots of little broken windows. And our little flying friends come in and they take up residence in that shop. So from 1990 until 2013, there were 250 odd pigeons, many generations of these pigeons living up in that place. And if you look at the expanse, the massive size of that shop, it was a daunting job. I remember one time back in, I think 2005, somewhere in there, I climbed up on one of the ladders and I pushed up one of those ceiling tiles, which was a mistake. This stuff rained down on me. I stuck my head up in there, and I was stunned at just the appearance of the shop, how neat it looked, how big it is. But my heart sunk, because as I looked over that huge, vast area, I saw twigs and newspapers and you know what, really thick. And some of the tiles themselves were actually the, the, the uh, plastic uh, coating that was up on that had failed and some of that bird stuff was starting to discolor and starting to bulge some of those ceiling tiles. So I knew this is a problem somebody's going to have to deal with. Well, we want to bring the shop back such that we can do the work that we need to do. Not likely going to get a 250 ton crane, that would be great. If we could have the same type of crane they had in there, that would be great. But how often do we need something that big? And that's a million and a half dollars. So I can spend that money on a few other things. A crane of this size is a fraction of that cost, and it can get the job that we need to do on a regular basis done. We've also bought some articulating uh, forklifts that can do other lifting jobs for us. As you'll see in a few minutes, we've bought some other machines. This is a really neat view of the shop. This is taken from the northwest corner, and that's a 4,000 big boy boiler. When they built this shop in 1919, the biggest engine they had back then easily fit in that bay. When they had to lift big boys, they had to cut the back of the cab off. And you could barely shoehorn the front of that smoke box. The door couldn't be open. 
and you'd cut the back of the cap off and you could pick that, pick that boiler up in the air. Well, tomorrow we're going to start lifting the big boy again. We're not going to pick it up as high. We're going to remove the trailing truck. And that represents the last major piece, or the last piece period, other than Jimmy's caps here and there, that we have on the big boy. Here's another shot of the crane. It's really neat to see. That picture doesn't do justice how big that, that crane is. And we had to shoehorn to get it in there. We had the company that, uh, that built it hired a, a specialty construction firm. And we actually lifted each one of those pieces. They're 13,000 pounds each. We lifted those things up and hoisted them 48 feet up to that crane rail. The reason we wanted to go with the crane and put it up that high is so it gives us the headroom to make the lifts that we need to do. The lower crane rail that you can see down there was for two 20-ton cranes. Back in the days when they were rebuilding steam engines every day, you needed, I've read stories of this facility. There was an article in Railway Age magazine. The cranes were so busy they had to come up with a system of lights. So when you needed a crane, you went over to one of the bays and you, you, you turned on a light. And the crane operator, when he was freed up, he would go over to you and take care of what you needed and go over to the next one. I mean, just think about that. You know, all the work that they did. Well, we don't need a set of lights to use the crane, but we use it quite a bit. It's got a five-ton auxiliary hoist. You don't realize how much you need a crane until you have one because you're used to doing without. You either put off a big lift and you arrange to get Holcher, or a big heavy lift, a very expensive company to come up and make your lift for you. You plan for good weather because you've got to do outdoors. You can't move that stuff inside. And it just, it's, it, the, the whole concept of locomotive work takes on a completely different look. When you have a crane like this, one guy can put an air compressor on the engine in 10 minutes. You can hang the brake cylinders. You can do any number of things that you were doing before with a forklift, with a sling, or some other secondary way of doing it. Not that it's not safe, but sometimes in the world of a steam locomotive, when you got to lift stuff, if the safety department showed up when we were lifting some of this stuff, I would have to explain to them how we're doing this correctly and safely. They would kind of raise their eyebrow and see this air pump hanging off of a sling when we're holding it with this side of the forklift and we've got this other forklift over here how else are you going to do it? So it's fun work. This is our track. This doesn't look like it's part of the steam shop. We built a small room. We call it our clean room. And this is a computerized lathe that we use to make lots and lots of little parts. And it makes some pretty good size parts too. When you come up here in a moment, I'll, I'll share with you when we're done. A lot of the parts that we make one of the projects that we started on, as we start to put the front engine together, we need all these little special hydraulic fittings or compression fittings. You can't find a compression fitting this heavy duty at any hardware store in the country. We bought some 3,000 PSI compression fittings from a master car, an MSC, you can order that stuff. It's nowhere near as heavy duty as this. This is what a steam locomotive needs. And these come in and out of these big hydraulic, hydraulic pressure fittings here. Well, on the steam locomotive that was built in 1941, some of these old fittings are still in good shape, but not many of them. So, like oftentimes in the project, we just take all of the, the good stuff and maybe we'll sell it as a souvenir someday and we replace it with new. So we've duplicated that fitting and made it brand new. So just like the stay bolts and everything, we'll draw this drawing in CAD, doesn't take that long, and then you can email that file, and we could program it into this machine, put a piece of hex stock in there, the machine goes to town, whips it out for you in a few minutes. And then before long, you've got a whole drawer of all these nice new hydraulic fittings. This is the machine we just, this is the, the brother to that. This is called a track mill. What the lathe can't make, the mill can. 
Again, it's a computerized machine. Speed up production. Garland, one of my machinists, loves running this kind of equipment. You can see out the door into the steam shop. When you walk into this place, it doesn't look like the rest of the shop. And we wanted to make these rooms so we could keep the machines clean and do the really accurate work. If you've been to the steam shop, it's a dirty place. As many times as we clean it, that wind, that beautiful breeze that comes through Wyoming every now and then, brings with it tremendous amounts of sand and dust. And try as you might, that's just the way it is. And here's the nice cabinet that Ted has. Ted and Austin have gone through and they're putting all of the loop lines, as a matter of fact, we're done on the front engine, correct? So all the engine oil and all the valve oil lines are all installed on the front engine, as well as all the piping. This is the burner, and this is an example of what you can do with today's technology. So we can draw, Austin will draw each piece, and then you can assemble those, and you can also model those pieces as they fit together. You can subject them to certain stresses, you can flow volumes of liquids through them. It's just a really handy program. And I brought with us the burner for the 4014. And for those that are curious about it, it's not some big scary ominous thing. I can hold it in one hand. It's very similar to what's in the 844 and what's in the 4000, or excuse me, 3985. Just a quick little segue on the oil conversion on the big boy. If for some reason you did not want to run a big boy locomotive and people kept asking you, when are you going to run a big boy, what would you tend to do? You would downplay it, wouldn't you? If you didn't want to restore a big boy. And over a few decades, that downplaying would turn into, it's too big, it's too heavy, it can't turn anywhere, and it's impossible to convert to an oil burner. Well, that's worked into our advantage somewhat. That's part of what makes the Big Boy Project so fascinating, is for so many years, everyone pretty much assumed they would never see one run. Like in Allegheny, uh, the T1 project that we hear about back east. These fascinating big steam locomotives that are part of a bygone era that people never thought they would see, but it can be done again. This is part of a machining process, machining what's called a link trunnion. It holds the eccentric link. I'll show you where that's at right here. And if you get a sense, it doesn't look very big. If you've seen the 844 on YouTube, or you've happened to see the 844 or the Challenger operating in person, that link is flying back and forth. It's being, it's operated by the eccentric crank. It's where it derives its motion from the eccentric rod and it's moving the radius rod, which through the combination lever is changing the valve events. Well, you see that thing at 60 miles an hour and that link is just flying. I was gonna bring a link with me, but they talked me out of it because it's too big. It's all we could do to get that lubricator in the truck. And my hat's off for Ted and Jimmy for being so patient with me. They spent about 30 minutes yesterday before quitting time loading all this stuff up. So this link trunnion, one of them was broken, and it very likely broke when the locomotive traveled out to California back in 1961. Who knows, maybe it was broke before that. Well, they're, they've got a million, 200,000 miles on them. So I vote for new parts, and that was the whole part of the conversation when we, on an official executive level, were talking about a big point. We weren't just going to restore it enough to get it running. We wanted to do everything we could to make sure the railroad has the best serviceable locomotive we can, which means it's not going to be cheap, it's not going to be easy, and we're not going to be done tomorrow. So that's one of the many link trunnions that we have. And that's the link that I wanted to load up in the truck with me. Again, that picture does not do justice. It would be from one end of this table to the other, and it's a two-man lift, maybe three. And they're, they're forged, they're made exactly to the specification that the drawing calls for. It's an actual forging. And then we machine them. We've got a machine shop in Denver 
you don't really realize how many people are train enthusiasts until you get out in the world and you run across people. I'm not a die-hard rail fan. I personally am not offended by the word foamer. I hope nobody in here is. But I don't take exception to that. I mean, you're just a, an enthusiast. What is this train show? I mean, we're a bunch of people that like trains. We'll go to a car collector's convention or any number of enthusiasts, and we're all kind of the same like-minded people. Well, the guy that runs owns that machine shop happens to be somebody who's really into it. What does that mean for us? We're going to get really good service, and he's going to want to do exactly what we want. He wanted to laser engrave his business name on the side of that. <laughs> because he knows what it is. And we thought about it for a minute, but you know, we're, you know, we, we really, it's not going to have a bunch of stickers on the side of it. And so I said, how about this? How about if you make a little plaque and we'll figure out how to put it somewhere next to the valve gear? So we will probably do that. So we precision ground the link just as you would back in the days. And then we also had to make the link block. And the link block is what is connected to the radius rod. Can't quite see the radius rod too much with all these other lines here. But it's actually really intricate, very precision pins, tapered pins and tapered bolts that hold all of that stuff together because of the forces it's going back and forth. It's going this way and then it's jerked back that way and back. It's just tremendous inertia forces and the forces that are driving the mechanism. And the valve it's moving isn't, isn't some little light little thing you put on your coffee table. We couldn't bring one of the piston valves with us. The thing is huge. So in order to keep all this stuff together, it's very precise. And we had them machine those link blocks and we've given them 4,000 clearance on either side. And when you put it in there, it fits good. And at the surface, the heat treating is called nitriding. So it's a, a mild steel. It's not any special alloy. But the surfaces that that link block run in are hardened as well as the link block. And we grease this locomotive about every 100 miles or so. And so we really keep those greased up really good. By comparison, when you look at the link blocks that came out of them, they're about almost a little bit, about five sixteenths of an inch bigger. That's how much worn they were. So which means they continue to grind that link out and they have to make a new link block a little bit bigger. Every time it's shot, a little bit bigger. It reaches a point to where these surfaces on the link are no longer really strong enough for us to want to use anymore. That's another reason why we, we make new parts. Same thing with this bearing fit here. This is called the link foot. And that's the link trunnion I was telling you about. So a new valve gear parts. Something I've always wanted to do. We're going to do this on the 844. And then if I have my way, we'll do the same thing on the 3985. I'll let you know a little secret. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> when, we, when we source these parts, I've got enough for both for all three engines. Don't tell anybody that. So that's the plan. If you're going to go to the trouble to make something, and it can be troublesome, sourcing big forging, sourcing big parts, finding somebody that can machine it for you, not that troublesome sometimes. But if you're talking about a crosshead guide, which is long as this table, and it weighs 1,100 pounds, it's a special forging, and when you're done machining it, it weighs 485 pounds, and all of those wear surfaces have to be precisely machined, that's not something you're going to find down the street. Luckily, we've got Bonneville Machine in Salt Lake City has got a, a milling machine that the operator rides on. He sits in a little caboose cupola, and he rides along with that cutter as it's machining. And that's how it's done. These are something we've needed for a long time. Anyone want to take a guess at what those are? Any, any steam engine people want to throw a guess out there? Ted and Jimmy, you can't say anything. These are wrist pins. One of them's for the big boy, one of them's for the 844. How many think this is big boy or this is big boy? Big boy, raise your hand for me. Big boy? All right. Well, you would think that the big boy would be bigger 
because the 844 is designed to operate faster, the inertia forces that the running gear, the, the pins, the counterweights, all the valve gear, they really had to design that stuff and make it really strong to be able to run 110 miles an hour. It's not to say that the big boy isn't as strong, but the big boy is so big, they had to really economize and things couldn't necessarily be as big. It's not like you're taking an 844 and you're just doubling it. So certain parts are a little bit smaller. Those are wrist pins. And the wrist pin is where, it's really where the action is. So you've got the piston where you're taking the power of the steam and you're converting it into a mechanical energy. And that is being managed by the crosshead and the crosshead guide. That crosshead is the point where the main rod connects to that piston. And as the name implies, it's like a wrist. It doesn't completely rotate, but it flips around, just up and down, up and down, with every stroke. And that wrist pin takes a beating. And that wrist pin has to be solid tight in that crosshead. UP had a really unique method that I hadn't seen too many railroads in installing their wrist pins. Typically, it's a tapered fit, and it's fit from one side to the other. The UP involved what's called a split collar that itself is tapered and it engages in the outer fit. And there's a special tool that we made to seat up the first taper, and then we take the tool out, and we slide that slip collar in, and we put on that really characteristic looking nut. It looks like the Star of David. Have you seen that? That's for a locking wire. Well, that is the best system that I've come across. I've been around a lot of steam locomotives, and one of the things as an engineer you check a lot is that wrist pin. And from time to time, you'll come across them, and they'll be a little bit loose. And you want to take care of it right now. Well, we've yet to have these things loosen up on them the way they're designed. So new wrist pins, split collars. I didn't bring a picture of the, uh, the nut, but they're new as well. Now this picture, too, doesn't do justice to how big this stuff is. These are draw bars. And again, please don't tell anybody <laughs> But the draw bars on the top are for the 844. The big draw bars down below are for the 4000. The 844 back when I started as manager, we did an annual inspection and we found that the draw bars had been welded. And that's not permissible. So we had to swap them out and luckily we had a spare set. And we put that spare set in. And they're working and they're fine. But over time, like anything, there's no bushing inside of that fit. We took the draw bar bushings out. The draw bar pins were trashed. They've been welded too. So we made new draw bar pins, and we made new draw bar pin bushings, and we put it all back together again, and we're just kind of living on borrowed time. They're not new. These are, but what's in the 844 arm. I don't have a picture in this, this presentation to show the, the draw bars on 4014, but it sat around for years with that stoker right above the draw bar, and coal sitting up in that stoker. So every time it rained, that acidic water would just get down on the draw bars. We could probably use them. Uh, you look at, you measure it all up, probably strong enough, but it just gets to the point where, guys, let's make this stuff new. I don't know if anybody's ever had an engine, engine and tender come apart on you at 60 miles an hour, but it's not something I want to live through. So we're going to go with new parts. And again, please don't tell anybody, but the ones on the top are for the 844. Look at how big the difference between the two are. Now this is that crosshead I was telling you about. And again, this picture doesn't really show how big it is. But we've got the two halves of the crosshead together and we're, we're machining with brand new reamers and making the bolts that hold the crosshead together. Now we're going to get into some really fun boiler work, and this is forming up a mud ring patch. And this is a special tool that we bought. It's a cutter that you can take inside the boiler if you needed to. And we have special made, these are custom cutters that they've made for us. And we've made up this little setup. Ted, was this your project or was this Kurt's? See what I mean by everybody does certain parts of the project. So we've made a small fixture down below. And this, this cutter is actually designed to fit in the end of a pipe or a tube, a boiler tube. 
and it bevels. It makes a nice weld bevel for you. Well, we've modified it so we can make these fits, which is the countersunk hole for the rivet that's going to go in that. Let me relocate my mouse over here. So we formed that plate of steel. We formed that in our press bay break. You can kind of see it looks like it's got some zebra stripes on it. Each one of those is a bend line. So we have a big press break in the shop, and we just systematically do a little bit of math, and we lay out each one of those bends. And what we have, when we're ready, it fits into this piece. You've got that piece cut out because it's all worn out. And then we clean up these holes. Some of the holes are a little bit gnarly looking. So Jimmy and Donnie will get in there and weld them back up again, get in there with a nice reamer, clean them all up. And then we fit the next piece up in there. This is the water space when the patch of the boiler is cut out. And you can see we've been doing some grinding, some cutting, so we've got some debris down in here. This is the mud ring, or what's called a foundation ring. And these are the back sides of the big rivet seam as we transition from the back head around to the wrapper sheet. And these are flexible staple holes that you see. And they walk right up that rivet line, all the way up. And here's a flexible staple coming through. And you can see that this hole in the sheet allows, bearing in mind that that's about an inch and a half of thickness there, so that flexible staple can accommodate a little bit of movement. Down next to the mud ring, this plate isn't going to move that much. It sits behind refractory, but it will get hot and expand and contract. The higher up the sheet you go where it's exposed to the hot 2,000 degree gases, the fire, the expansion and contraction is going to cause those sheets to move. And we have to accommodate that, and it's done through the Flannery KJ head staple. Tremendous design. But this weld fit right here, again, the picture doesn't do it justice, but this is a very precision fit. How many degrees is that, Jimmy? 37 and a half. You sure it's not 39? I love it. And here we are with that piece fit in there. And we fit it in there with what are called fit bolts. And the fit bolts represent a rivet. And so we get it all fit up in there because oftentimes you're going to take it out, make an adjustment, put it back in and there's a lot of back and forth to get it hand fit. When you get that fit up in there just right, you want that to fit very precisely. Because when you go to weld it together, this is going to be, this will outlive me. This is going to be in there a long, long time. So we want it to be 100% rock solid. We've got it welded in and we'll take those fit bolts out and we'll preheat everything up. And it's a team effort, it takes all of us to do riveting and we get ourselves set up and we start putting the hot rivets in. It's one of Ted's favorite jobs. Here's a close-up of that fit. Real nice precision machining and that, that formed head that you form on that 1800 degree rivet that you put in that hole and you hit with what's called a 90 gun. It's a really big pneumatic hammer and it forms that rivet and you've got just seconds to get that job done before that rivet cools too much. You don't want to drive on a rivet if it gets below 1300 degrees. You could potentially damage it. Here in a moment uh, when we're done, I'd like to introduce Dick Stone. He's a mechanical engineer. Uh, he works with us and uh, he's done the Form 4. It's the regulatory work on the UP steam locomotives for a lot of years. So Dick's a great engineering resource for us. 1300, right Dick? Here's another shot of that fit up. How are we doing out of time, honey? Okay. This is the outside. We were looking at the inside a moment ago. Now this is the outside, and you can see a small little ring around each one of these rivet holes, and that was where the rivet was caulked. And that's a process, I brought some caulking tools with us, where you actually use a small pneumatic hammer, and you seal that rivet once you install it you cock it. And what it does, this is low carbon steel, so it's pretty soft. So you take that tool and you walk right around the outside of that and it forms the two metal together and it forms a watertight, steam tight, nice seal that'll last a long time. And there's one of the flexible stay bolts we pulled out 
just to kind of illustrate how it fits in there. Looking at the where the tube sheet goes up toward the front of the boiler, you can see the tube sheet braces and everything. We've yet to descale everything. It's uh, this picture was taken some time back, and we have a very thin tube sheet template. So we'll draw the tube sheets up just like the blueprint shows us, and then we'll send that file over to Puma Steel there in Cheyenne, another great one of our, our partners, and they will, they will laser that tube sheet profile into a really thin, easy to handle piece of steel. And then we can fit those tube sheet templates up and verify everything's right. And we've actually caught a few little mathematical errors or a few little problems here and there and if we would have went ahead and send that file off and taken our expensive piece of boilerplate, we would end up having to replace it. So this is a really good process of fitting up your sheets. This is the outside of the boiler, and you can see all the different markings as we're going through and fixing up the fit around here where those caps are welded on. And these are all flexible, stable holes. Washout plug there, MKS cap, and you can see the staples that we've got removed because we're taking patches on the inside of the boiler and we're replacing, or some of those staples were just not good enough and we yanked them out of there. There's those eyebrows I told you about. The Challenger has those as well. All the big UP coal burners had them, and that was out of necessity to keep those stable heads alive. And you can see this one here, you can actually see and look at how it's worn down. And there was one that actually broke off and they welded another one on. So when that eyebrow breaks off, that head erodes down to nothing. And you need to have enough material on there. We don't have to take all the staples out, but it has to have enough material for us to, to form it. So we'll rework each one of those just a little bit. We call it touching them up. If there's not enough material for us to move around and to give it another profile, because we'll seal weld around that as well. If it doesn't have enough head material, bolt's got to come out. And this is what kills a lot of big steam locomotive projects. You climb into a boiler, in my judgment, you should not approach it from, I think it'll be okay. In my judgment, that's, that's the wrong approach. In my judgment, you approach it from, we've got to make this thing rock solid 100%, which means it's subjected to the hydrostatic pressure beyond the maximum allowable working pressure, and you're going to climb in there and you're going to tap each one of those bolts. If something fails, you're just going to take a hot, a warm shower. If it fails at 300 PSI, we won't be with you. And others could be hurt. There was a very serious accident with the 844 in 1999 in Sacramento. And it suffered a tube loss of 10 tubes. And that was a big warning wake-up call. And that illustrated various practices had over the years slowly lapsed water treatment, and tube installation. So we have to approach everything we do and make sure we're doing it right. I brought with me two, our, it's kind of a, a collection of the old books and the old practices. This is section three, Boilers of Locomotives, 1952, a lot of really good information in there. The Flannery Stable, you can get this on the internet. There's amazing things out on the internet today. And then some other neat things that we, we go through. This was from a test that Union Pacific conducted on how stables were installed and the best way to install them. And they conducted a lot of tests on different locomotives. They assigned certain locomotives to be a part of the test and they, they would equip it with that particular method of installation and they'd put it in service. And then they would do another test on another locomotive and so on, and they would see an actual field performance how well they did. Then they would go and they would actually take the plates, the boiler plate, the firebox plates, and they would subject the staple to sufficient force to rip it out of the hole and to see how much force it took to rip it out of that hole. And that's, uh, that led to the, the methods that we currently use that were adopted by the UP back in the 30s. This is a, a drawing that I've included before. This is another one of the staple tools that we, we made custom. Uh, we've got a, a, the same company with the gentleman that, that uh, wanted to laser engrave his business on there. 
made us these out of tool steel. These are drawn and made exactly to the UP specification. You'll find tools like this in a boiler shop oftentimes, but they'll be worn out and it gets to the point to where it's really not giving you the performance you need, so you need to make a new tool. So that's what we've done. We've made all new boiler tools, stable forming tools. This is from my own personal collection. I keep these in my office. This is the caulking tool, and this is the stable forming tool here. All brand new. And that's what the stable looks like when you're done driving it, but you're not done yet. You'll actually walk around it with the caulking tool, and that's what the caulking tool does. It gives it that real nice formed ridge around the outside that forms the two metals into one. But you're not done yet because you're going to subject that piece of metal and the plate that it's holding to a lot of heat. And you've formed a really small little piece of metal, very small. And over time, that fire is going to do what fire and water do to steel. It tears it up. So that fire is going to get in there, it's going to overheat that piece and it's going to lift up a little bit. And as soon as it lifts up, the heat cannot conduct itself into the, into the metal and therefore into the water. And it's going to get really hot and it's going to start to fire crack and the fire crack is just going to get more and more progressive and it'll eventually propagate into the steel and now you've got a bigger problem on your hand so what you want to do is we'll get jimmy in there this is jimmy's handiwork and he's going to seal weld and now you're physically attaching the stable to the firebox plate so there could be no development of heat that will eventually destroy steel. This is low carbon steel. Over 1950 degrees you start changing the steel. The characteristics of the steel are damaged. So you've got to keep it nice and cold or cool. I don't want to say cold but cool. So every one of those staples get that same treatment. For steam locomotive guys that's really a nice looking picture. Here we are looking in the firebox one more time. This is before the tube sheet went in, and this gives a really good illustration of the radial staples that I was talking about a moment ago, and all the other staples. Look at how heavy duty that thing's put together. Now all of that's covered in water. Your water level is right about, I don't know if I can reach it, right about up in here. That's called your foam trough. So you've got a fire in there that's burning 7,000 horsepower worth of fuel and that fuel is, that heat is conducting through all of those metal surfaces and it's not like a little pot boiling on your stove. This is one heck of a steam power plant. That steam is really going for it in there. And here we are putting the plates together. We've got the tube sheet fit up here and we're starting to work it in place and we'll close this gap up in here and here's all those stable holes and another weld line there and we'll start welding it all together. And there's Bruce. He just loves a challenge. So some guys would take and probably grind that by hand, and some guys are really good with a grinder. Well, Bruce doesn't want to do it by hand. He made a block of wood with a special angle, and he fastened this grinder on there, and he walked that tool around there and gave us the most symmetrical, very nice weld fit, which Jimmy and Donnie can then turn that weld fit into a whole series of beautiful, high-pressure welds. Well, look at the smile on it. <laughs> but that's the rear tube sheet, 9 16 thick. That is one big piece of steel. Isn't it, Ted? And here we are, this I took yesterday, we're taking the ramp out because as I mentioned we're going to take and jack that engine up in the air. We've got four 50 ton screw jacks and we're going to pick that engine up such that we can drop that trailing truck pin out and we'll roll, we'll have to clear the back part of that trailing truck and we'll roll that trailing truck out so we can do it. It's our next project. We'll take the wheels out, probably be able to use the axles and the bearings, but I'm going to put new wheels on. And the ramp, these ramps were installed in 1957, went all the way over to here, so we've cut all that out, 
and eventually we're going to take some more of these ramps out. It makes it really nice to be able to walk around up high and look at the engines, but you can't work on much stuff. So if you've got to work on your steam locomotive, it's got to be on track four, and you can only work on the north side of it. Take it out, turn it around, and then you can work on the other side of it. So we'll take those ramps out, we'll be able to work on both sides. And there's the big boy boiler. It won't be long, we'll be putting that front engine back in. Now there's the front engine, as I mentioned, all of these these yellow colored lines, that's an insulating material. It's an abrasion resistant Kevlar. In the old days, they had an asbestos type sock sleeve, just like that. So we replaced it with Kevlar. But there's hundreds of feet of the copper line that I mentioned, just like this, with all these special fittings on there. And it's just a work of art, fitting up each one of these lubricators. I don't believe I've included much of a detailed shot, but you can see the manifold on each side. This would be valve oil, this is engine oil over here. So on the engineer's side, on a big boy, those lubricators were filled with valve oil. On the fireman's side, they were filled with engine oil. And there's the front with a nice new air shield. We had to do a little bit of dental work. Over the years, the, the pilot had been banged up here and there. And back in the days when the railroad put stuff together, these were utilitarian machines. They welded a piece of steel on there, and they were going to quit running it in a few years anyway. So Donnie spent the better part of a day custom fitting three-quarter inch plate and grinding it, making it look real nice up there. This will be a really photographed part of the locomotive, the very front of it. Here's some of the piping. I apologize, it's at an angle. I had to hold my phone to get that get that just, just right. And this is kind of speaks to why the Challenger needs to be rebuilt. This is on the inside of the locomotive. So all of this pipe on the Challenger is rotted. And it's been replaced with rubber hose. And if you happen to be in Cheyenne, the next time you're there and you look at the Challenger, go look at the front end and you'll see this rubber hose coiled up. And it runs back and it's plastic zip tied along and runs back to the second engine. In order to get that fixed, you have to take the front engine out. And here's the new pipe, all brand new. That's heavy wall, Schedule 120 piping. It duplicates each one of those fits. And you've got to have a pretty heavy duty pipe bender to make those kind of bends. And there's no other way to do it. If you're going to bend one or two pipes, get the, get the, get the uh, torch out and have at it and have fun. You'll be frustrated in 10 minutes. You can do it. There's no way we could have bent this pipe with a torch. We'd still be doing it. And this is what it looks like. This is down on the inside, and there's no way, you can't even reach in and look, you can't even put your hand in there. There's no way to get to this unless the front engine is part, apart and the drivers are out. So this is a big shopping job. So that's one of the problems on the, on the good old 3985. It's probably filled all the way up to here with junk, cinders, grease, and who knows what. And because of that, those pipes sit down in there and rot. Especially if you leave it, you sit, sit around with water in it, and it gets cold, it rusts, it turns into a big mess. Another one of those pipes, angling around and snaking up and around through there, just a real tedious process. We wanted to make sure and not have any threaded fittings inside because we'll never be able to get to it. And you know as well as I do, that's the one that's going to be leaking when we go to test this. To pass an inspection, the main reservoir has to, has to pass an uh, air pressure test, just like the brake pipe. So do the main reservoir, or excuse me, the brake cylinders. So when we do our main reservoir leakage test, and the main reservoir pipe union down in the middle of the front engine is leaking, what are we going to do? We're going to fail the test. So we've welded all of those pieces together and then fit them in there and snake it around in there and poke one end up barely enough so you can weld it the other end. It was really quite a job. And that's what it looks like. So you've got the brake cylinder pipe poking up out of there. And here's Ted's lubricator. So Ted handmade this piece right up here. It's a strainer, and that's the original one. 
and he very painstakingly hand cut, made a small little die to hand cut each one of those gaskets. These are a heavy duty cardboard gasket for each one of these pumps. And these are the pumping units themselves. So if you think about how the lubricator works, if you've ever seen a steam locomotive going down the track, you'll see it. This is actuated, actuated by the valve gear. And each one of those cycles is moving a little ratchet. And there's a frame in there with a little rack with a set of balls moving up and kind of oscillating. And each one of these little pumps moves up. And if you can, you know, when you come up here, you'll be able to get a better look at it. This is called a double pumping unit. There's not very many of these in the lubricator. But this moves upward, and that spring helps return it back up. And as it does, there's a small little slot. And a slot takes a little slurp of oil, and it rotates down, closes the port, and discharges it through a little check valve. And it's all the way down the track, each one of these. A brilliant steam locomotive innovation made by one of the great manufacturers that made steam engine parts. You wouldn't find anything like this in modern industry today. They've got some really good stuff out there, but I'm here to tell you, nothing is made like the way they used to make it back in those days. You look down inside here, and this thing is built like it was inside a Sherman tank. And that's what you want, because there's some very critical things that you're lubricating. The valves in the cylinders, the most critical things on the locomotive. If the valves lack for lubrication, you've got minutes before you've got a huge problem on your hand, and that thing seizes up. Remember that nice, new, beautiful link I told you about in that eccentric rod? It's going to look like a piece of, piece of spaghetti, and it could yank it off the engine and twist it around and slam it into the ballast and bang it up into the boiler, and you can't stop enough, quick enough, when you've got your valve gear falling apart on you. It's a very, very important piece of the engine. Ted can answer a lot of questions on how he rebuilt it. He did a beautiful job. And here's those other fittings I was telling you about, the beautiful manifolds. There's a lubricator on either side. And on these engines here, you've got a lot of lubrication lines up front where those big steam lines that are supplying steam to that articulated front part of the engine as it's moving around the corner. All of this is flexible up here. And they did it through an ingenious use of ball joints. And each one of those ball joints is lubricated by a high pressure fitting called a terminal check, receiving its oil from that lubricator. A tremendous amount of lubrication. There's, a, there's that view I was telling you about. Now look at that beautiful workmanship. Looks like something you'd have in an automobile. But this is original. This isn't something that we came up with. This is how the blueprint shows put this thing together. Very organized. Each one of these little labels here, as you'll see on that one, actually has a description of where that feed goes to. So when you have a problem, like when we break the locomotive in, we're going to turn the feeds up high. And then over time, we'll just systematically, we'll go through with the chart, and we will start dialing the feeds back as necessary. You don't need to be wasting that oil. But we got to make sure everything is getting the right amount of oil, and that's how we'll do it. This is the underside of the engine. When the drivers are in, you can't get to some of this stuff. This is for the shoes and wedges. And this is that fitting that I was holding up a moment ago, right here. That's why we made these new. Because once they're in, we don't want to have any problems with them. And they're really hard to get to. When we brought the big boy back from California, we cleaned all of this up. Everything that we needed to have working, we got working. So it would be oiling the parts that it needed to oil. And we had to get down underneath there on a few occasions and look things over. And I'm here to tell you, there's some places you just can't get to unless you've got a pit. So I'm pretty skinny. I work my way down in there. And you climb yourself and wrap yourself up around an axle. But now what? You can't move your arms. So you want to make sure this stuff is rock solid. This is the front. These are the new steam valves. And this is all the piping that controls the live steam to the air compressor. All done, all put in. Air compressors are installed. And there's that piping as it pops up out of the back 
and, and connects to the flexible joints that connect it to the back of the locomotive. A brand new connecting nut on the steam side of an air compressor. This stuff just gets old and it's just to the point where you just got to make new parts. It's some of the neatest things on one of my the satisfying moments is when I walk around the locomotive and see those pieces. And we're just about wrapped up here. This is a big reinforcing joint inside the boiler. And this is a rivet that we have to replace. On some of the rivets on the outside of the boiler, the head popped off for some reason. Over time, they get rust underneath there and that rust pushes that head. And there was a defect in the rivet which caused the head to fracture over time, decades sitting out in the park. So what Bruce did is he painstakingly drilled down to the center and look at that, he got right on it. So he got himself up on a big work platform and he made this big setup and he drilled through five and a half inches of rivet and he was able to drill through the center of it. So he could get a bigger and bigger drill and continue to drill through there so he could knock that rivet out. This took him one day, eight hours of work to remove run ribbon. If you end up screwing up the, the sheets, then you're gonna have to ream the hole bigger. And as it is, these rivets are as big as we wanna drive, trust me. So it's, it's, it's worth the eight hours of time to get your best guy over there that's gonna take his time. And I had to get a picture of it. He came and got me, he was, oh, come look at this. And it was just dead through, wasn't it? We like this stuff. And here's some air brake parts. And this concludes this part of the presentation. Uh, this is kind of the same stuff we did on the 844. And this is Ted's handiwork. Going through and working on the air brakes and making them as good as new. This good air brake system was developed in the 40s. Actually, it goes a little bit earlier than that. But it is the kind of air brake system that you want to have on a big steam locomotive with a passenger train. When you're running a passenger train, it's different than running a modern train. There's air brake things that you do, there's handling procedures that you do. In our world today, we have what we call fuel conservation. So what I do on a steam locomotive would be considered what we call power braking, where you're pulling a train and you're keeping it stretched and it makes a nice smooth ride for the passengers. Well, in a freight car, it doesn't understand and doesn't care about being smooth. Well, in order to really manipulate the air brake and to control the air brake, in my judgment, this is the system that we want to have. So just like on the 844, we took that completely apart and we rebuilt it. And Ted did all of that work, this beautiful workmanship. And there's one more quick picture. If, uh, what, what time we have, honey? When? Okay. Um, if, if everyone's interested, I have a few slides. Uh, we moved some equipment from Burnham to the Forney Museum the other day. If, if everyone's interested, I can go through and, and show you some of those. These slides kind of jump around a little bit, but this is a piece of equipment that's been sitting inside the Forney Museum for a long time. It's a crane that the UP referred to as Aunt Peachy. It's quite a neat little machine. And we've got one of the museum volunteers, you can see up here. I don't know if you can see it on my mouse, it's not working. But we've got a, one of the volunteers is up there. We've got some pretty close clearances. When they put that equipment in the museum, they went in and installed some gas heaters and some things like that. So we had to shoehorn some of this stuff in there. Luckily it all fit, we didn't have to change too much. So here we are walking this equipment in and we, how often, would a museum have an opportunity for a big class one railroad to come in and couple onto your museum display equipment and take it out and then bring in equipment that it donated. That's pretty, pretty unique that that happens. I'm not saying it doesn't happen all the time, but it's really, a, it was a lot of planning and a lot of preparation that led to this. There's another neat view of Aunt Peachy. Some of these pictures, well, they were all provided by Chip Sherman. I don't know, Chip, are you here? And Nick Valdez. Thank you very much for these pictures. I really appreciate all the work that the rail fan community does in documenting things.
video or, or still photography. I really appreciate that. And our roles, we, we don't, unfortunately, we could capture some really cool video, but we can't have any, any electronic equipment while we're operating the equipment. And now we're down at the Burnham, Burnham Yard, and this equipment had been there for, for a couple of decades, maybe a little bit longer. And very, very lucky that this equipment was restored, or excuse me, uh, preserved. A lot of this equipment in any other scenario would be cut up. There's some neat stuff down there. This is a GP30 locomotive, 1962, is that right, Ted? 62-ish. Um, uh, the 3006, it was a Colorado Spring switch engine, and I've worked on the railroad long enough, I ran it as the Colorado Spring switch engine back in the 90s. I think it retired eh, sometime in 97, 98 is when it last operated. So we came down and we started to dig out some equipment that the 40 Museum uh, is receiving. And here we are with the operating crew and myself. Uh, we're just starting to switch this equipment out. Uh, for those of you that are into Rio Grande trivia or Rio Grande history, two of those are ex-Rio Grande GP40s. It's just coincidental. When we put these moves together, uh, we don't, because it's a special move, we don't have power assigned to it. So as luck would have it, we got what we call the local power, three GP40s. still having problems with my mouse here. I'll have to move a little bit closer. This is the most interesting piece of equipment in my opinion and I, I really became fascinated with this piece of equipment and, and we owe those that preserved it back when it was, it was initially retired, I want to say in the 80s sometime. And this is the former Denver and Salt Lake 10300 built in 1913 Industrial Works 120 ton derrick. For those Denver and Salt Lake Moffat Road fans, this is Moffat Road right here. Uh, back when the Denver and Salt Lake was reorganized after the death of David Moffat, they, they had an opportunity to, to refinance some things and to buy new equipment, and this was part of that effort. Uh, before that time, if you're into the history of the Moffat Road and Rollins Pass, those guys re-railed Moffat Mallies and any, anything they needed to deal with, rotary snow plows, they did it with block and tackle and blocks and hands and frogs and, and blood, sweat and tears. So this was probably a welcome addition to the arsenal, and there's pictures you can find of this up on Corona Pass. There's a picture of it on one end of the, the rotaries. Uh, it's got a hold of the 210 at Sulphur, and they've got a big giant chain wrapped around the barrel of the engine. The 210 derailed there at the west switch of Sulphur, and here comes, the, here comes this engine. It's all steam, and it's still original. So it was just critical that this equipment be saved. Just to back up a little bit, I, I got involved in this effort when the real estate department called me and uh, began communicating with me if, if I could help find a way to not scrap this equipment. And there was a, a gentleman that was interested in this piece of equipment, but the railroad had said they did not want to move it by rail. And it's prohibitive to take something that big apart. And, and I'm, I'm officially, I, I can't really spend a lot of time on anything other than the big boy, and you understand why. So I went down on my own time, Nancy is very, very gracious. She let me go down there how many weekends, and Jimmy and Ted came down with me and, and helped us a little bit, but we had to get this stuff ready to go. So as I began working with the real estate group, I said, well, why don't we just move it? And uh, so we came up with an opportunity to, to, to get it moved out of there. We can't save everything. But uh, it was really a, a good effort to save this. So I've been all over that. We've had to lower the boom just a little bit because we're going to take it through the Moffat Tunnel. So it's going to make one more trip over the Moffat to Granby, and it's being donated to the, the Moffat Road uh, Museum over at Granby. And here it is, a Union Pacific locomotive maneuvering that GP30 into its place where it's going to be for many years. A lot of people will be able to enjoy that locomotive. They, they have plans to paint it and fix the cab up, fix the broken windows, scrape off all the graffiti, and it's going to be a nice piece of equipment. 20 years ago, you would think a GP30 in a museum, we wouldn't even go look at it. 
But as time goes on, the diesel electric fleet that were, was the mainstay of the fleet when I was growing up, all that stuff is, is a secondary equipment now, and many of it has been scrapped or retired. So it's nice to be able to be involved and have an opportunity to save this equipment, because otherwise it's going to go away. And 10 years from now, we would have looked back and said, gosh, I wish we could have done more to save that. So I think about it, my, my mentor Ed Gerlitz was around when they were scrapping steam locomotives. And they were young men at that time. And politically, financially, they did not have the means to really intervene. But had they had the ability to intervene, there may be equipment that we could we can enjoy now. The Rio Grande saved virtually no steam locomotives. So to be able to be a part of this has been been something that I was I was eager to help help them out. Ted was down with me, physically helping with the move, and Jamie was there uh, helping us get it all together again. But this stuff kind of goes on behind the scenes. And there it is. It looks a little ragtag right now, but when they get some paint on it, get some number roars back on it. Uh, it's going to make a nice display piece. Okay, well that uh, that's the end of the presentation. I've got some more slides and some stuff that uh, would probably be boring to a lot of people. But if you happen to be interested in some 3985 things and 844 stuff, uh, maybe we can talk about that a little bit. What we can do for a few minutes, we've got to vacate the room by one, and we need to clear some of our heavy stuff out of here. So we have, what time is it, honey? 12.30. We've got about 15 minutes for questions. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask about what we're doing and how we're doing it and how this stuff works, you're welcome to uh, kind of filter up here if you'd like. You're welcome to come up and look at it. Please be careful. There is a tripping hazard here. I've, I've hit it a couple of times. And I ask that you not pick anything up just because it's dirty and there's some sharp parts. These staples are going to go in the boiler in the next week or so. So as such, they've got little sharp edges on there that will come off, so please don't pick anything up. Does anyone have any questions? Um, Sir? My understanding is uh, this the will be uh, uh, going to Auburn. His question was that uh, the locomotive will go to Ogden, and that's the vision that it'll participate in the one of the greatest rail events in Union Pacific history, and that's the the anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike. And yes, that's the vision. Uh, we're still planning it. Uh, we've got lots of planning underway. The vision is that this locomotive in the 844 will participate in what they did back in the day. We obviously can't go to a promontory. There's no track there. Uh, they're going to have a series of displays and events and commemorative things going on out there. So there's going to be a whole series of things surrounding that. But that's our focus, is to have the locomotive ready to go so it can participate in that event. What year? Pardon me? What year? 2019. Wow. Sure. The question was, when are we going to test the 4014? Uh, when we, I want to have the engine done the end of this year, beginning of next year, and when we do that, we're going to have to test it during the cold winter months. Hopefully, the weather will be nice. But uh, the way we're putting the engine together, it'll be able to run in the winter. That's one of the big challenges with running the Challenger, for example. It's got so many pipes that are broken and frozen and leaking and. It is a nightmare to have that thing running in the wintertime. So with an eye to running it year-round, we, we're setting it up so we can run it, make sure everything runs good. But when we test it, uh, it's still up in the air right now, but my vision would be to take it to Greeley. They've got a really nice new Y down there. Maybe to take it to Egbert, maybe to take it up to Morrill, uh, you know, turn it up at Joyce Junction. Um, we certainly go back and forth to Spear probably come to Denver overnight, you know, any one of those scenarios. But when we test it, we'll announce the actual schedule, but bear in mind that this is testing. So we're, you're going to see it going around the yard a lot. And we're going to work out a few things, and we've got to make some track and, and measure the swing out and various things like that. Uh, but uh, just like any break-in run, 
don't live by the schedule because we're going to stop and we might turn down those feeds I was telling you about. We got some feed that's stuck or whatever. We'll want to be able to trick everything out and take time and, and break it in nice and easy. Sir? How many of the burners that showed us earlier in the presentation are in the firebox? There's only one. Just a single one? Yeah. The yeah. And, and there again, just like the other castings, it's a lot of money to pay to have something like this made. But once you've got the pattern, this isn't that expensive. So we've got six of these, just you know, three, six, five. You know, I mean, you buy three for this amount. Okay, you buy five for this amount. Okay, let's buy six. Okay, we got twenty bucks off. So we've got <laughs> we've got six of these. But the vision is is I'm confident that this burner will work in this configuration right here. And again, because of so much of the speculation and hyperbole about oil converting a four thousand. There will be very little problem with the oil conversion. Uh, the Southern Pacific, other railroads, Northern Pacific had big oil burning fireboxes, and it's just not that complex. You've got to have a fuel source, and you've got to flow that source into a means to atomize and burn it. And uh, and of course, the the way that that's done is a pretty simple system. What some would say, pretty rudimentary. But that's the way the UP did it. Uh, we are going to make a few deviations from their blueprints. They actually have the blueprints for the oil conversion of the 4000 class. We're going to deviate just a touch based on uh, the things that I want to do. Just to kind of give it some, uh, just things protecting the circulators, for example, the big circulators in that firebox. And the other thing too, it's important in my judgment, to keep the circulators in, for those of you who don't know what circulators are, they're big pipes that convey water from either side up to the crown sheet. And they're, there's two purposes. One is to, as the name implies, to circulate the water. A big giant firebox that big. It was that big because that's how much of that rock springs coal, that's how much physical grade area they needed to get that 7,000 horsepower out of that volume of coal. You don't need that much with oil. Oil's got a greater heat content. So you've got parts of the firebox that are hot, parts of the firebox that aren't so hot. Big mud ring on that engine is flat, so you don't have the benefit of gravity aiding the flow, the convection currents within the firebox. So the circulator takes it, warms that water up, and it's like a fire hose on that crown sheet. And that water is sucking right through those circulators, and that's that is that's a good thing because that stimulates that circulation of water. So instead of having areas that are really hot over here and areas that are kind of cold and stagnant over here, that's not good when you're talking about all those big staples. So you want that circulation. So the circulators stay in. We'll break them up a little bit, and and as we get in, I don't want to give too much stuff away, but. Because we want to be able to, to, to show you what we're doing. If I tell you everything right now, nobody will come back next year. <laughs> but long story is, or the short story is, this is the burner. Come take a look at it. That's just like many oil burners. Uh, it's interesting. I've got some friends. One in particular is a petroleum uh, engineer. And, you know, we can get all comp really get deep into all these combustion theories. But let's come back down a little bit and just realize this is a big steam locomotive with a burner in it. And just like those cap forwards, the cap forwards were very successful locomotives. And for those of you who have had an opportunity to climb in the firebox of the 4294 out of Sacramento, you'll see what I'm saying. It's not that complex and it'll work really good. And if it doesn't, well, you can get on social media and you can really beat me up. Let me show you, I think it's this picture here. That was a Challenger in 19, I don't know the date, but it's back in the, in the 90s. And as the story goes, they had some problems and the fuel truck didn't arrive, so they loaded it full of diesel fuel. And they were struggling to make steam pressure as evidenced by that black smoke coming out of the stack. Black smoke with a coal burner is pretty common. With an oil burner, Black smoke is a very inefficient fire, very inefficient. 
And what, what you, the, the majority of the heat that you get, the heat value is that radiant, bright, white hot flame. That is the most efficient combustion. So as Ted knows from his experience as an oil burning fireman, my background comes from the Southern Pacific. My main steam mentors were Southern Pacific California oil burning firemen. And oil was, uh, smoke was a no-no. They would, they would be rolling their eyes if they saw you doing that. And they thought on you if you smoked it up. So with that in mind, and then over time you learn by smoking a firebox, oil, a very inefficient, dark, smoky, sooty fire, you're really working against yourself. Because that creates, it's almost like a velvet fuzz that sticks to everything. And that creates an insulating layer that is inhibiting the best heat transfer into that firebox steel. And therefore you have to sand it out. And sanding out only gets you by a little bit. So you want to set up the boiler so it's not a smoky mess, a smoky disaster. Because over time, when you're crowding it, not only are you wasting fuel, you're wasting four or five, maybe even 10, 12 gallons a mile with that smoky cloud. We came back, there was a quick story, when we came back, we, we kind of miscalculated when we were in Council Bluffs, and the fuel truck driver we had at that time didn't really want to make a, a run and, and get us a load of fuel, so we figured, well, we'll, we'll pick you up at Columbus. And we measured the fuel in the, in the, uh, the locomotive, and we've got three, 400 gallons of cushion. Well, that's cutting it pretty close to go from North Platte, or excuse me, uh, Omaha, Missouri Valley, Fremont, and into Columbus, Nebraska. Well, we didn't make it. And we're going along 50, 60 miles an hour, and then pressure starts dropping. And here's the new firing valve. And you've got this firing valve in your hand, and you've got it all the way, you're straight in running. That's what we call it. Firing valve's all the way open. Well, what's happening is you're running out of fuel, and the bottom 500 gallons of fuel, we didn't calculate that into our 300 gallon calculation. You just write that off. Because of the gravity of the head pressure of that fuel, if you're going uphill, you're really in trouble. If you're going downhill, you get a little bit more. So we slowed down to 40 miles an hour and we were able to maintain 300 pounds for 10 more minutes. And then we didn't make it. So I buzzed up and of course I didn't want to tell the dispatcher, hey, we ran out of fuel. It's the last thing you want to tell them. Hey, we got to stop up here at Central City. We'll let you know when we're ready to go. But somebody told them that we were out of fuel and all you know what broke loose. So there's 30 fuel trucks headed our way with fuel that we don't want. I'm, I'm exaggerating. So our fuel truck driver, really good guy. He got on the road and met us there, maybe a 20 minute delay at that. But it's a valuable lesson. Don't mess around with your fuel. Well, we're gonna be pushing the envelope on fuel consumption. My estimation is if we get everything set up right, we're gonna be burning maybe 25 gallons per mile. The 3985 historically burned 35 to 40 gallons a mile over its life since I've been involved with it. So if we set everything up right, we get the burner, we get everything everything drafting the front end, all that other stuff set up right. We're gonna have an efficient engine that's gonna make the best use of that fuel. So for those photographers that like to see smoke, I apologize. A good friend of mine, Dave Gross, told my friend Ed Gerlitz one time, we were coming up from Spear, or from, uh, from Carr, and he was waiting for the smoke to come up over the ridge. Next thing you know, here we come, boom, popping around the corner. He's scrambling to get his camera. And he said he used an expletive. But that expletive Dickens in his no blanky smoke <laughs> caught me off guard and I didn't get the picture I wanted. But when we fired that 844, Austin and Ted and I, uh, Austin and Ted and Kurt are the only firemen that I have. Ted's my main fireman. And so he's the one that you want to complain to if you're not getting enough smoke. <laughs> And Austin too. But you're talking about guys that are really into the technical aspects of maximum performance and guys that understand the nuts and bolts, nomenclature, the cause and effect. They know everything about this stuff. And they're going to squeeze, not that we're trying to be efficient, but it's just really the way that they did it back in the old days. The bunker oils were a little bit different. You had to heat them. They tended to smoke a little bit more. 
but on balance, you want to uh, have the cleanest combustion possible. Well, we're probably getting pretty close to needing to get out of the room. So if you guys want to come up and take a quick look at here, and we're going to start making the room ready for the next person. Thank you. Thank you.